Jay Billis, ESPN College Basketball Analyst. He was on the call for NC State, the uh, ACC Conference title game over uh, North Carolina. He joins us on the program. How many career blocks do you think you had at Duke? Me blocking somebody else's shot or my shot getting blocked? <laughs> well, my shot getting blocked. I said, I promise you, I set a record. <laughs> well, you were an undersized center, though. Yeah, undersized, <laughs> under athletic, <laughs> under everything. Were you underestimated, though? Uh, yeah, probably. Well, look, I at- underestimated. I underestimated, my, <laughs> underestimated myself. What do you have, Paulie? In four years at Duke, I have Jay Billis with uh, thirty-seven career blocks. Wow. They didn't keep the stat of how many times his shot was blocked. No, I'm looking for that. Okay. All right. It was more than that. Yeah. It was more than that. But I was a position defender, Dan. <laughs> of course you were. <laughs> I was like the cover corner they didn't throw towards, so I didn't have to block a lot of shots. Yeah. Okay. You were a, like a Darrell Revis. Nobody was going in your direction. No question. I mean, it was. Just, I got my work done early, <laughs> as they say. Billis Island uh, there. All right. So when you first saw the bracket, the first thing that jumped out was what? that UConn had a really uh, difficult bracket and uh, there are a ton of conference champions in their bracket. I still think they're the the best team and they'll come out of there. And I thought Purdue had the, uh, the easiest route for a number one seed. Um, It's, it's set up pretty well for them to, to get out of there, but it's not like they don't have challenges. Everybody has challenges, but they're not facing a team that can up tempo them and turn them over, which I think is one of the, the problems that they, they may face. Felt like the reaction was the seeding, that certain schools, conferences that may be too high, too low. Uh, your thoughts on any uh, objections there? Yeah, I think there were a few seeding issues, but some of it had to do with, I'm sure, their bracketing principles. I mean, I, I, I thought, I kind of think, Dan, when they say, well, you know, the, the Yukon region, the East region, Yukon chose to be in that region region and then we put everybody else in there based upon geography the closest uh, teams to that and you know the, the first thing i think of is wait a minute usc and ucla are in the big 10 now they got to fly to records for a regular season game and you're worried about geography for an ncaa tournament game mm. you know that doesn't make any sense to me uh, i think you seed it according to to the best teams and you balance it as well as you can uh I, you don't want to be insensitive to travel you don't want to send you know, somebody out uh, cross country for no reason when they're the same as somebody else. But I, I, I tend to think just do it on a strict S curve and put them in the bracket. And let's play this is for the national championship, not not to be, you know, so that some fans have a bus trip. Any issue with setting up matchups? You know, I always think of Texas Tech and Indiana when Bob Knight was at Texas Tech, like the potential for an interesting matchup. Any issues with the committee doing that? They say that they don't do it. I have a hard time believing that. Uh, There are way too many coincidences that occur. Um, There's nothing they can do about, you know, if, if, uh, you know, Rick Barnes is going to meet up with Texas in the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight. You know, you can't can't deal with that. But when you when they're on a collision course in the second round or, you know, things come up in the first round, you know, they had a choice there. How many teams can realistic uh, realistically win it all? You know, I haven't really done that sort of thing this year because it was such a weird year. Um, usually it's around eight. And I, I, after looking at it, I think it's about that. You know, if somebody else could sneak in there. There's a difference, Dan, I think, in getting to a Final Four and winning a national championship. You know, when, when you get put into a region, whether it's East or Midwest, whatever, 75% of the best teams in the, the tournament are not in your region. So if somebody falls down in your way, a lot of things can happen. But once you get to the final four, uh, you know, you're playing uh, higher seeded, really good teams most of the time. And that's why we we most often see the highest seeded teams win these things. Has Danny Hurley become the face of college basketball, men's college basketball? He's getting there. Um, He's the real deal. He's really an outstanding coach and he's fun. Like he's... uh, He's kind of old school and how tough he is um, and demanding in practice and with his team. But then he's a normal Joe off the court and he's got these bizarre superstitions that are uh, uh, are bordering on uh, needing therapy, you know, like the underwear and socks and, you know, wearing the hat uh, uh, that he wore last year before the first round, stuff like that. 
my favorite one was uh, I don't know what they call these things. Um, it's like these uh, you're suspended. You're suspended in some kind of liquid, I think, and they close it. Close the the. It's almost like a coffin. You know, you're in there. I, I, what do they call it? sensory deprivation? Yeah. And uh, he went in one of those things, and his, he thought it was going to be for an hour. And his staff had made the appointment for an, uh, two hours. So after an hour, he thought he was trapped in there. <laughs> and, uh, and that would have been a good one to, to see Danny Hurley trying to fight his way out of that thing, thinking he was trapped. He's uh, Jay Billis, ESPN College basketball analyst. We just noticed that the transfer portal is open in college basketball. Why? Why now? Why are they opening it while the tournament's going? Yeah, it's it's just sort of their timing for the way some of these school calendars work. The way I understand it. Um, you know, look, the, the transfer portal overall is, uh, I think, a good idea, but they could certainly regulate it better and have the dates work out a little better. I mean, I think you'll hear most coaches say that as soon as the season ends, they're busier uh, than they were during the season because of the transfer portal. They're having to sift through and call a million people and evaluate players and all that stuff because that's become the new recruiting model. And it's it's impacted their high school recruiting. You're not seeing high school recruits uh, valued as highly as they were, uh, you know, five years ago. But that's just the the nature of the business now. The NCAA put the rule in, and and they're having to live with it. Should we cap the number of years you can be eligible to play college basketball? Well, they do. Um, it, it's basically you have you have four years, um, but they do make exceptions when you have like a catastrophic injury or illness or something like that. And then we've had over the last several years this extra COVID year. So you're seeing that that's really the difference in seeing guys come back. I don't think you would have seen as many guys, as many players stay and play if the COVID year and NIL didn't overlap. Like there are a number of players going, well, why shouldn't I come back? I'm making a lot of money. And if I go into the into the NBA process, you know, maybe they put me in the G League or I have to go overseas or something like that. Um, it, it may be better for them to, to go ahead and stay. So we're the NIL, we've seen retention of players, which I can't imagine isn't a good thing for the NCAA. They get another year of service out of the players, even longer than that in some cases. And uh, and the players are getting more education, which they say they're about. So how, how could anybody complain about that? Trying to figure out, Zach Eady, that being the biggest big man in the tournament, but it's still about guard play. It, it, you know, like, how do you assess? I mean, normally that, that'd be the guy where you go, they got the big man. But I don't know, is it that much of a bonus for Purdue over everybody else? Well, I, I think you could have said that back in the day when big guys were more uh, a focal point of the game. You know, Ralph Sampson played four years at Virginia, never won a title uh, because the guys around him didn't hit shots uh, when, when when they needed to. And uh, Joe Barry Carroll was a great big guy at Purdue. We can go on and on about it. Now, now UCLA won with big guys. Other teams won with big guys. It doesn't mean you can't win with it. But the games change, as you know, and uh, you don't see many guys 7-4 uh, and that dominant, but uh, Purdue has had a couple problems in the last few years. Uh, their guards last year were freshmen, and they weren't the most athletic team around Edie. Edie was dominant against Fairleigh Dickinson, but his teammates just didn't make shots. I don't think they're going to be subject to the same kind of upset this year, but um, but they could get beat. There's no question that somebody could clip them, and and they could very well play Tennessee again. They played earlier this year. And Purdue won in Maui, um, but but I still think Purdue is a uh, is a prohibitive favorite to come out of that region. You've got some schools, some big name schools that are not going to compete in the NIT. Uh, you know, St. John's and Pitt, and Syracuse. Um, I always thought that that would help you for the following year. Get some of your younger players; they get an opportunity. And I don't know if these kids are just saying, "Look, we don't want to play in the NIT." Uh, your thoughts on some of these? Coaches having to come out and say, look, we're preparing, you know, Rick Patino, we're preparing for next year. I don't know, Dan. I mean, I know going to the NIT is a real downer and some teams go in it and they want to prove that if they, you know, they win the NIT, like they're, it's going to be a big middle finger to the NCAA tournament selection committee. And the truth is the selection committee doesn't care. I mean, they care about the process, but they don't care if you win the NIT. And there are some teams that go in the NIT, they're disappointed. It's, been, it's the end of the year and they go in and lay an egg and it wasn't worth the effort. 
So it just kind of depends how the, I think, how the players feel. And, uh, you know, I kind of like that uh, if the players are being taken into consideration, you know, I kind of like that they're being listened to. Like, why go through all that um, if uh, if you really don't want to play in it? And look, I mean, when was the last time you you remembered who won the NIT? I, I don't remember. I don't watch it. I shouldn't say that because it's on our network, but I don't watch it. I'm I'm focused on something else. It's a it's like these bowl games, you know, like I don't care who plays in the Poland weed eater bowl. Maybe I maybe I'd bet on it with a friend of mine because there, there was nothing else to do, but I'm not watching. If I gave you an all time final four, what would come to mind? All time final as far as the best one? Yeah. Um I seventeen was great when Villanova beat North Carolina. Um I, I wind up thinking about moments more than anything. Like I it's funny, Dan. Like I don't really know what makes a great tournament. Like some tournaments where the play is off the charts good, but we don't have as many little guys winning or there aren't as many buzzer beaters. People say, well, this has been a blah tournament. I think people kind of expect um, that it's going to be crazy. And if it's not crazy, then it's not that entertaining. But then you get to the final four. And if you don't have recognizable names, then people don't care for it either. So I'm I'm not sure what's great. I, I just love seeing great teams play. And, uh, and we get that just about every year. So I can't remember a bad year for the tournament. Um, there was one year where Connecticut played Butler. I think it was 2011, played Butler in the final. It was probably the worst played final game ever. But nobody really seems to remember that. They just remember who wins. Yeah, I, I say this every year, that we love the chaos. And then we get to the Elite Eight Final Four, and then we want the Blue Bloods. Like, okay, that was nice. And if you do have the novelty or the Cinderella, then you want to see them go all the way and win it. Then it becomes a great story. But I, I, it'll probably be the same this year where there'll be upsets and it's crazy and madness. And then all of a sudden you're going to have four blue bloods. Do you have a Cinderella team to keep an eye on? There are a few. I think Drake is one. Um, I think New Mexico and Nevada are both uh, very good teams. Um, James Madison has a chance to to pull an upset over Wisconsin. James Madison, uh, I think they've only lost three times and beat Michigan State at Michigan State in November. But it's funny, Dan, because of all the upsets in the smaller conferences, um, the 12 through 16 seeds aren't quite as powerful as they've been in other years. Maybe powerful is the wrong word, but the, the metrics say that they're, they're not as big of a threat. That doesn't mean individual teams like Drake out of the Missouri Valley conference. They have Tucker DeVries who averages about 22 a game. Um, He's not quite uh, as good as, as Doug McDermott was at Creighton, but he's pretty damn good. And they can, they can beat somebody. Um, they're capable. McNeese State is, a, I'm not sure whether they're McNeese and now or McNeese State, but they're playing Gonzaga in the first round. And Gonzaga is still very good. They're not as good as they were the last couple of years. But McNeese can force a lot of turnovers. Um, and, uh, and they've got a player named Shahade Wells who, who uh, can really take the ball from you. Um, so they could be a threat. But I'm not sure I'm seeing that many teams. But but I didn't see St. Peter's ripping off all the games <laughs> they won either. You know, you just don't see – you don't think of a 15 seed. And even when you've watched them play, um, because sometimes they, they catch fire. Like NC State in the, uh, in the ACC tournament, I wouldn't have given you a nickel for their chances to win four games, let alone five. And it was one of the most amazing things I have ever seen. And the most interesting thing for me in the first couple of days of the tournament are going to be, is there any gas left in the tank for NC State after that? Because they're they're not only like banged up and injured, but I just can't imagine how emotionally drained. And then the NCAA gives them a Thursday game. They can't even give them a Friday game. <laughs> uh, I had Stephen A. Smith on last hour, and I said, who's the best shooter at ESPN? Taking away the NBA guys. And Stephen A. said he's the best shooter in the building. I will give you the opportunity to answer that you know i am i am always interested in what 60 year old men are good at because <laughs> you know it's so it's so like edifying for me to think that all of us are still really good at something like who cares we're done man i just want to make sure i can get out of this chair as soon as the interview is over without falling down and hurting myself so i'm not i'm not putting myself in any of these contests i don't even play pickleball I'm going to get injured playing pickleball. I want no part. If that's going to affect my golf schedule, 
I'm not playing pickleball. I don't care. So you don't care if Stephen A is a better shooter than you? No. Why would I care about that? Uh, what I would care is if we're playing golf and, and there's money on the line, then I'd want to know how good he is. Oh, okay. but, but but he'd be the great guy to play against because he would go, I am a plus four. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> good to talk to you. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you during the tournament. Thanks as always, Jay. Great to be with you, brother. Thank you. That's Jay Billis, ESPN College Basketball Analyst. He was on the call for NC State against North Carolina and a big surprise there. That certainly was.